Well, welcome. Welcome to the University of Chicago Law School. My name is Seth Orenberg, and I'm the president and founder of Law Inc. Law Inc. is a law and business society dedicated to bringing the law and business schools closer together. And I'm really happy to see we have some Boo students in the audience. Thank you. Welcome. We hope you come to more of our events. Today's presentation is going to be great. We have a, a panel of experts in lots of different types of technology law here to talk to you today. So I'll introduce them. Uh, from your right to my right, we have Rick Rule. Uh, he's a graduate of the law school, and he's the record holder for the youngest assistant attorney general. Uh, that was for the antitrust division. He's the antitrust counsel, uh, outside counsel for Microsoft, and has worked on many uh, seminal matters, such as the consent decree. And he's a uh, senior partner at Kidwater, Wickersham, and Taft, a prestigious DC law firm. We welcome him to bring his practical experience to the table. Randy Picker is also a graduate of the law school, as well as the college. Apparently, he couldn't get enough of University of Chicago. It's true. And decided to return to become a professor <coughs> of commercial law. He also wrote a book on game theory, and he helped draft Article 9, uh, the Secured Transaction section of the Uniform Commercial Code. He teaches antitrust, network industries, and technology policy, in addition to several other courses. And we welcome him to the panel for his broad and deep scholarly experience. Neelai Patel is a graduate of the college and a graduate of Wisconsin law. He uh, practiced copyright for a while and then wised up and hmm. decided to uh, get out of big law and become a technology blogger. He was most recently the managing editor of the popular technology blog Engadget, and now he's working on a new project. That's me. I'm, also, I'm just here for jokes. <laughs> <laughs> These guys are smart. It's a secret yeah. project, but we're, yeah, hoping, well, you know, we're hoping he'll spill the beans today. <laughs> and we'd like him to you know, share his experience with how consumers relate to technology and the law, and also maybe how to get out of big law and become a technology blogger. He quit. <laughs> <Desperate>. <laughs> Things happen to you. Rick Carr is our moderator. Uh, we bring him all the way from New York City, where it was 75 and sunny today, mm -hmm. to uh, Chicago for today's presentation. He's a technology journalist, a professor of journalism at Columbia <laughs> University. He recently produced the Emmy nominated documentary Net at Risk in 2006. He also has produced numerous things for NPR and PBS. The only thing he hasn't done is graduate from the law school or the college. But <laughs> we'll have to forgive him for that. We're honored to have Rick here to lead our discussion. Without further ado, please. Uh, okay, thanks everybody for showing up. Um, uh, I actually want to start, uh, I think we should start with copyright because that's what we were talking about downstairs. And I'm wondering if, uh, uh, are, are we going through another big wave here? I mean, what's, what's, what, what, what's, what's the lay of the land right now, uh, Neil? I, what do you think the lay of the land is copyright-wise right now? Um, I think consumers are, so the, the first wave you're talking about is the 90s. It's actually... No, I start with Gutenberg. See, that's Gutenberg. where I start. But I, I don't know where you want to start. The first wave of the digital copyright All right. wars. Yeah, the the RIAA sued Gutenberg for yeah, exactly. transferring books. Period. Damn Johannes. Yeah. Uh, it's Universal Music Verse yeah, exactly. v. Gutenberg. Pretty good. Uh, no, so when I was an uh, undergrad here, um, that was when Napster came out, and I think that was very much the first wave. It's, okay, oh my god, I can copy these files between my friends very, very easily. And obviously there was tremendous copyright holder pressure against that. And that died down and then Apple said, well we can actually sell these files and people will buy them. And a little bit later they said, well we can even sell them without digital rights management and people will still buy them. And they're tremendously successful. Uh, and then you, that moved on to music and, and, and movies and subscription services. And now I think you have an entire generation of users who are trained to think all of my media is digital and all of it should be digital, and there's all these things I want to do with it, and I can't do with it. Um, you know, you have a Netflix subscription, well, every device has to be Netflix enabled. You can't transfer that content, you can't move that content around. Um, you know, I think it's ridiculous that if you have a DVR, if you record something on your DVR, you know, you have fair use rights to that content. You can transfer it to your iPod, you can put it on your phone, but you have to be at home lucky enough to catch it at the right time, even though you're, most people are paying for cable for that content to come in. I think there's a lot of discussion in the industry. You have companies like Google who put out basically the Google TV, which is a computer that hooks up to your TV, and the networks and the, the content holders who said, we're going to block this product because we don't understand how it fits into our revenue stream. And I think there's just a lot of conflict there about how, who owns the content, what rights are we signing The DVR situation is so interesting, though. So I, I know, you know I, I go to conferences. I talk to other copyright professors. I think a lot of people think that if we relitigated Sony, not about the VCR, but, but about the DVR, it's not clear how that case would come out. 
right? Part of the premise of the Sony case was, was that there weren't these alternative markets where you could go get the content, right? They weren't selling VCR tapes and the like. So when you recorded something on television, you weren't necessarily substituting out of an alternative market. Now, of course, all of these markets are out there. And so, um, you know, if we relitigated the DVR case, obviously you'd have to update for who's on the court now. But just just on the integrity <laughs> of the argument itself, right? It's not it's not I clear. Think what relitigating for who's on the court now is which business is bigger. Well, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm not that cynical. I mean, so I'm, I'm a blogger. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> you specialize in cynicism. <laughs> That's all right. I do. Cynicism and snark all day long. Um, well, no. Let me ask you this. I mean, you say there's a market, but is there? I mean, the market for music is iTunes and Amazon. If you know, if I wanted to go and compete with Reckless Records on Milwaukee Avenue, if I had enough capital, I could set up shop next to them. Uh, for sale means I could go and buy all their inventory and well, sell Well, we see there's a market. I mean, uh, what wasn't the case back you know, in the days that the VCR case was litigated is I couldn't go get this content in a legitimate way. Right? So when we turn, now we'll head inside fair use. Right? When you turn to fair use, obviously it, you're a copyright lawyer. I mean, there's, it's a four-factor test. And one of the questions is, is, well, what does this use do to the market for the work? And so now, I mean, through iTunes and the like, or through Netflix and the like, I can get so much of this content. Well, I mean, but right now you can say, well, there's DVRs. Everybody has one. Right. And the market for the work is almost unaffected. In fact, it's growing. Right, because well, people are going to Netflix, they're going to Amazon, they're going uh, to iTunes. But this argument about, about the relationship between the market for the work and its use, I mean, you, you go back and look at, I've, I've looked at ta the, the migration from sheet music to piano players, right? Uh, I mean, that, that was in some sense, if you ask about the technological migrations in copyright, sheet music was huge at one point. Right? And then the piano player comes along and the wax cylinder comes along. And you see exactly these same arguments there. And, and so I don't think the structure of the argument has really changed in a century. It's really quite shocking how consistent the argument is. And in some sense, the question is, is do we want to assign the right to the copyright holder as to who gets to make the choice as to whether that argument is right or wrong? Uh, uh, you, I mean, yeah. I'm just a... You're just an antitrust guy, yeah. I will say, though, interesting, when I was uh, a student, uh, my third year, I wrote a paper for Posner on before... Uh, Dick Posner at that point. Not his son. Yes, yeah, but exactly. um, uh, but on, uh, on fair use and uh, VCRs. Did you really? The VCRs, but that was... Uh, it was a long time ago. Um, but what kind of grade I, did you get? Uh, I, did pretty, I think I did pretty well. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but uh, the, uh, uh, I guess the one thing I would say is what has happened has pretty much destroyed the music industry, hasn't it? I mean, the pro part of the problem, and, and you know, is uh, again referring to uh, one of my former professors, who I guess still teaches here, Frank Easterbrook. But oh, yes. um, but when Easterbrook was in the um, uh, in the Solicitor General's office, there was a debate uh, about you know protecting copyright. And Frank's point was, if you don't protect the rights in some way of the artist, then no music will ever be produced. But is, is, which pro is, is protecting the right of UMG or any of the big record companies actually protecting the rights of the artists? I mean, I think a lot of artists would argue it isn't. And the point I'm trying to make is, it may have destroyed the music industry, but has it destroyed the market for music? Right, I mean, there's more music. I get sent more actual music. You know, we do right. a podcast, we do a show. People are like, look at this music, put it in your show, give me the exposure I want, I'll go on tour. And that's what the artists want to do now. Because they know that assigning those rights to a label isn't necessarily their path. Well, I mean, it would, it would be an interesting question to see what has happened to the output of music. I think a lot of people, in terms of you know what music is available, uh, sure, there's a, a lot of you know people. There are always going to be artists. I mean, this was part of the point to, to Frank. It's not the case that if you got rid of copyright, there wouldn't be people writing songs, right, right. or performing music. There's no question about that. But the question is, what happens at the margin? if you essentially destroy the rights and destroy the ability of people to, to earn a return. So, I, you know, and, and I, I, what I know, what little I know about copyright from uh, back in the day, I do think that, you know, some of the arguments that are being made about some of these things being fair use probably are wrong because I think they are destroying the, you know, the market. Well, let me, let me ask this, and I'm actually really curious to get yeah. your answer to this. There's this conflation in copyright law of the content, yeah. the idea, and the, well, the, I guess the idea is a really bad word to use there, but sort of the yeah, content exactly. and, uh, <laughs> and the physical, tangible copy, yeah. right? The book is the copy. It's, the book the is expression. The, yeah, the, ex yes. oh, that's <laughs> the expression and the, and the physical, and, and tangible, tangible object. Um, 
but that has been completely destroyed. And our copyright law regulates copies. It regulates, you're going to write this book down again. What's happened is, 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 is we've got a copyright statute, and it's been premised on this since at least 1909, where there was a match between the rights model and the physical instantiation. Right. Those have separated, right? And, the, and, and we, we still need to figure out what we think the rights model should be. That's a separate question from right. business models. I'm not talking about mm -hmm. business models. I'm talking about how do we think we should give you rights. But all the business models are built on. Exactly. Are built on, right? Exactly. And, and, those, and those have decoupled. But I think they've decoupled because in of such technology. a violent and, and paradigm shifting way that the consumer no longer understands the business model, right? They look at the market of things they can buy, of content they can buy, they don't know and they say, they I think. think. Right. Well, I do. I mean, well, what I mean they, by they that tell is, me very, very but, okay, but what I mean by that is, is, is do they, do they, I mean, you see these surveys, right, which they recognize that if I go into, I don't even know if record stores still exist, right, if I go into a record store and shoplift a CD, they recognize that it's a different act than swapping files on a peer-to-peer -peer network, right? They think those are different. The question is, why do they think those are different? Is that the experience of the technology, or is it something else? Well, I mean, I think it, it, it's something else. It's something really tangible. It's that people are used to communicating on the internet, and we've also built a culture on the internet, online, that is almost anarchic. And is, I mean, the internet is built around the idea that we will not regulate this. We will see what happens, right? And so people on the internet get to do whatever they want, which is, I mean, they really think they can do whatever they want, and there's no rules around it. So when you have, like, the Sony case, this kid hacked the PS3, right? right. And Sony sued him. Right. Terrible PR move for Sony. Well within their rights. Sony has now been attacked. Right. Their entire the entire PlayStation network has yep. been taken down. They're stealing credit card numbers, or they think they're stealing credit right. card numbers. That's basically an act of terrorism. Yep. Right. But the back end of it is that when Sony did sue this kid, George Hotz, they they did what you would do. I mean, any lawyer in this room, they they sued him. They subpoenaed YouTube to see all the people who looked at his video. They subpoenaed his credit card processor to see who bought his code. All the things that you would do, and people freaked out. Oh my God, Sony is way off the line, right? They're over the rails. They're doing things nobody would ever do. And it's like, well, yeah, I mean, if you were selling physical stolen merchandise, this is exactly what you do. Well, but, but it's just because it's this intangible online thing that people believe that regulation and what is. And what I take it Rick does every day is you have to tell your clients, obviously, look, what your rights are on paper and your ability to enforce those, that's not necessarily in your best interest. That's what Sony's seen, and we've seen that repeatedly in these cases. And so you have to make a decision, a business decision, about whether it's really sensible to enforce your rights or not. But I'm saying almost every case I've seen of an organization, an individual enforcing their rights for online activity, has been met with reaction that that is improper. I understand. Okay, but so let me just ask, well, why, why is the fact that consumers are unclear about what their rights are and what the holder's rights are, why is that an argument for no rights? Because, because I think, and I mean, this isn't my argument alone, but I think when you raise an entire generation that says, the law doesn't apply to me because I don't believe in the law, or I have been, somebody has tried to teach me the law, and, I, and this happens to me, I try to teach people the law, and I get replies and emails that say the law is stupid, it doesn't matter, this is fair use. Right, and that's like, oh, I mean, that's I've very given, I've given talks to my kids' uh, computer <laughs> yeah. science classes at the lab school, and they think I'm from Mars. Right, and I think it's, once you no raise question. an entire generation. I'm really from Venus. But, right. Uh, you know. <laughs> no, but once you have an entire generation that says these laws don't apply, right, then you have an entire generation that may also think other laws don't apply, or that there is an ability to say, this is so wrong that I don't have to believe in it. Can we, and, can we go somewhere else with sure. copyright for a second and talk about Amazon cloud music services? Because sure. It feels like a tangent, but I don't think it is. It's right in there. Yeah. Okay, so what what are they doing? This let's fill let's fill everybody in on how Amazon's cloud music is working. Um, so, who, does anybody bought music from Amazon from iTunes? Have you ever lost the song or gotten corrupted and you want to download it again? You can't, right? And they because they only have a license to sell you one copy, and they can't transfer another copy to you after your initial transaction. So what they Amazon has done is they given everybody all their customers five or twenty gigs of storage, right? And it, when they buy the, the song, they transfer the copy to your storage, which is assigned to you. It's, it's yours. And once it's in your space, you can copy it as many times as you want. It's yours. And you can stream it. They put out an app that lets you stream it from your storage to their, to their app. And so this looks, I think, for all the world like they've developed a new service, when all they've really done is sort of hacked the existing model for the service and said, well, instead of transferring it to your computer, we'll give you some cloud storage cloud storage, and we'll transfer it to your phone. 
the labels freaked out, right? Because they don't have the licenses to, to launch that service that looks But the labels have practically the right. labels haven't filed suit yet. They have they you know, they they put out this is what they do. They send me press releases that say <laughs> Amazon doesn't know what they're doing. We must we must investigate this, and then I have to like sit there and like the labels say. So right? do we think though that's the thing that the, the point that Randy was making about what Rick says to his clients, which is like somebody is saying to the labels, wait. You don't 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 move on this yet because this is this is your bread and butter now. You're not selling records at Reckless anymore. Virgin Mega Stores closed. This is the way you're selling music. Don't I think someone is saying to them, "Be careful." Yeah, I mean, I think that's why it's rolled out slowly, right? Because in prior situations like this, you know, the Beemit example is the one that comes to mind for me, right? Which was the same that's kind of right? right? Yeah, exactly. Which was a music locker in the sky, as it were. Right? But so the difference is there was no transaction. With no, 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 I understand. The idea was is I was supposed to be able to basically bring my CDs, rip those CDs, and store them remotely, right? So they were simply providing substitute storage for my local But you, you didn't transfer your bits to them. No. That's the big difference. Well, I, well tell me, okay, but, but so you tell me why you think that matters. Well, I don't. Yeah, okay, I didn't think you did. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, the, the difference, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. from the law perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, we can, we can right. do, right, but you don't to really To distinguish the cases, because their argument, MP3's argument, was this is functional fair use. Right. 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 Which is, I mean, at the time, even I read that, and I was an undergrad, and I thought, well, that's stupid. But think about right. how you set up this discussion, right? You set up this destruction as, oh, they're sort of protecting you from losing songs, right? I mean, I, I mean they're I marketing. Mean, I, any, any, anyone, ha anymore. anyone have any broken CDs at home? I mean, right. part of that's a decision about how we allocate the risks associated with destruction of the content and the media, right? Well, sure, but I mean, I think that. Amazon's trick. They don't give me a free CD when I walk in with my broken CD. You know, when all these digital services launched, I mean, that's, I remember the discussion on iTunes was, well, Amazon can win, because all they have to do is sell you the CD and then sell you the digital content, because everybody still wants tangible physical media. And that was five years ago, and now nobody wants a CD. I'm the, must be the only person in the room still buying CDs, but I dutifully get them, I rip them, <laughs> and put them on my iPad. Well, you know, with all these alternative markets for digital media, they're all premised, you know, when you buy a CD, it's very simple. You have a CD player and you play it. Right. Digital media is premised on you have a computer, you know how to use it, you've connected to the internet, you're paying the fee, you have a portable device that you understand how to sync to your computer. Right. I mean, I can see why the record labels would be very hesitant to say, well, this is our new business model, selling it to this class of people right. that understand how all these devices work. Right. But I think it's their future. I mean, I oh, can't yeah. imagine they should keep printing CDs. No. And then if you, well, go ahead. No, no. Uh, uh, I, well, I'm, my, I'm curious about whether, you know, DMCA was written in what, 90, written in 97, passed in 98, yeah. sometime in there? I, I, and it strikes me, DMCA and um, uh, the Telecom Act, both written in the 90s, both written way before any of this stuff happened. But with the DMCA in particular, I wonder if it's just like, is it time for us to revisit this? So, I mean, it's interesting, right? So, the, the, think of the telecom. So, we went from 34 to 96 on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's scary, <laughs> right? I mean, you're talking about six decades before, and, and, you know, lots of stuff happened in the meantime, right? The DMCA, I, I would say that the people, and I also mean the industry who wrote the DMCA, <laughs> got exactly what they wanted and, and, you know, think they're probably happy with that statute. They just want it enforced, right? <laughs> I mean, right? You know, the cynical thing would be they, they got the statute they bought but, and paid for and now they just want to see it implemented. But, I mean, this goes right back to that PS3 conversation. Sony is enforcing its Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree And completely. the backlash from this tiny vocal, and, I mean, I do not agree right. with their actions. The backlash is killing their business. The cost of enforcing the DMCA. Well, and the ability to organize these these you know group consumer responses has really gone up, right? And so I think that means the practical ability of firms like Sony to enforce their rights have dropped. Uh, so let me, I mean, right? Yeah, yeah. but so I mean, but you know, AT and T won a case. The Supreme Court yesterday is saying it did. We can, we can. But that's just can, when contracts go to the court talk case, right? Right, but I mean, the, the flip side of that is, or, you know, we'll hack your network to bits and shut down your This business. is the, the arbitration class action case, which I printed but have not yet read, so. It is a, it is a master, Breyer's Descent. It's 5-4. It's pretty amazing. Have you read this? No, I haven't read it, but. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's, I'm I so, love, you can I tell I'm a huge nerd. I've left the law and I'm still, like, here. Yeah, That's I, good. I, I love the way every time I come to a law school, it's like 5-4, it's like a sports score. It's like, the Sox, <laughs> the Sox won yesterday. <laughs>
No um, overtime. Sc yeah, right. Scalia scored a big one. Knocked it out of the park. Where does uh, the 800-pound gorilla who we haven't talked about yet, where does Google fit into all this? Google fit, uh, Google Books. Um, if we're going to talk about uh, copyright at this point, I mean, is that at all a game changer? Is, is the technology We'd, I'd love a game changer? Take Google Books, which I, I think I've written three papers on a little cottage industry. So, I mean, we don't know where we are, right? In the sense mm -hmm. that if you've been following the case, um, uh, the, the decision sat there for basically a year. Uh, Judge Chin ruled in February, finally, um, and found that the, the settlement was, was simply too much, too far. Um, the critical issue in Google Books is with regard to so-called orphan works. Those are the works where we can't identify who the rights holder is. If you're an academic like me, those are the books you want to see online, right? I'm not interested in bestsellers. I'm interested in the obscure. That's why I'm an academic, right? And so those are the books. You know, I wrote a paper recently on, on razors and blades, the, basically the history thereof. And, Google Book Search was a godsend for me. I'm looking at the advertisements that Gillette was running in the 1920s and the 1910s. What a, what a resource. Um, but Judge Chin said that uh, the sort of going forward arrangements that the class action settlement with the Authors Guild would have implemented was too much, um, didn't approve it, and Google ha basically hasn't said boo since then. So mm -hmm. I, I think everyone's trying to figure out what to do. It's very easy to say, oh, we should have orphan works legislation. I testified on, on, on the settlement in Congress. Everyone understands that, and still no one does anything. So, Well, I mean, this goes back to, I think, the, the big stakeholders in a copyright act, they're, I think they're happy with it. I think they're like, well, we legislate copies, and that might not be what people expect us to, to regulate, but we've built our business on this model. And so rewriting the act, I think, is not in their best interest, because they have to rethink their businesses when you actually make that decoupling efficient. But the orphan, go ahead. Well, the only thing I was going to say is, is there is a little bit of a different perspective. Uh, essentially, you could view it as a clever way for Google to uniquely be able to extract and capture all the value and make it impossible for anybody else to. Well, no, I, I wrote a paper against that, so, so I'm with you on that, right? So I said, look, they're creating an orphan works monopolist. Right. They should multiply the number of licenses. That's what I pitched. Right. Uh, and, and maybe that would have worked. I will, but if you look at how, I mean, again, I have the perspective of being concerned about their uh, position in search. And the way they were making uh, Orphan Works and the other stuff available to any competitor was essentially controlled by them. Absolutely. And, um, and so I think ultimately that's really what Google wanted to do. I mean, I think Google's interest was probably more in the area of search ultimately. So they probably would have been happy to give multiple licenses to their uh, to, to folks who wanted to sell orphan work. Yeah, yeah, but again, I, I, I want to distinguish those two. Right, multiple right. licenses would have mean the whole kit and caboodle, right, right, search right, and right, yeah, yeah, right, right, right. But um, uh, but again, I, I think that you know Google essentially one could say had a view that was not terribly respectful of the rights holders was willing to, hold, in a wholesale fashion, copy things without necessarily uh, taking care of the uh, rights holders if it got sued. Yeah. And it was, you know, part of the argument Amazon, speaking of Amazon, was making was, hey, look, you know, we copied stuff too, but we actually went out and negotiated the rights, which is inherently more expensive uh, and puts us at a, at a significant disadvantage. Um, and uh, so I, I mean, I, now I, the interesting question in, in the Google book settlement is, you know, again, a lot of people lose sight of this. All the judge did was say you can't have a settlement. Right. The case goes on. Absolutely. And, um, uh, and there are some kind of interesting questions on fair use and how that applies in, uh, in the search context. Now, do you think, I mean, I'm, I'm always interested about the relationship between, you know, what do we think we accomplish in antitrust? So the so question we'll talk about in my antitrust mm -hmm. class is, is what did the Microsoft case actually do, right? I mean, so, it, okay. And, 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 do we, and do we think that the emergence of Google, for example, has anything to do with the, with the, with the final judgment that was put in place? Okay, different question. But, but here I'm curious, do you think Google felt free to be very aggressive about copyright because they weren't shackled by, by you know, government scrutiny in the way that I point at Microsoft and point at you, but <laughs> I mean, Microsoft, would Microsoft have been more aggressive over this dimension if they hadn't gone through? I don't, I, I, I mean, you know, 
who knows, but yeah. I don't think Microsoft would have. I think that part of, again, uh, I think Neil said they're the most interesting company. Yeah. And, and part of the thing that is interesting about Google is um, they perhaps are guilty of what Microsoft used to be accused of, and that is drinking the Kool-Aid. I mean, they kind of believe in their shtick. And, um, and they kind of believe, I, I think there's an argument that they believe that what they're doing is right. They believe oh, they that, it's, that it's yeah. very good for they everything do. to be in the Google universe, yeah. for them to see everything, to control everything. They'll give people access to it. And again, there's sort of that pernicious, you know, their product is really you and me because they're basically taking us and selling us. But, <laughs> but I think they, they um, uh, uh, that is their product. You know, but, right. uh, but, but, they, uh, you know, they do believe, I think, that it can't be bad that they have all this information. They're going to make it available to everybody else, but they lose sight of the fact that they're earning, which, you know, I mean, money's fine, but it's $25 billion or so it's nice, every, every year. It's 97% of the revenue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Oh, well, yeah. You know, was, we were talking about In the Plex earlier, which I think a really interesting book. It's sort of the, the Google biography, deep access. And there's this whole chapter when they first put up Google and they're building the algorithm. And they're like, man, this is amazing. I can type in what movie, what time does this movie start? And we'll find it for you. And it's like, that's great. You've built a great search engine. But it's actually the data is what's important. It's, it's you're the conduit to whoever else figured out what time the movie started. Right. Like you didn't, you didn't figure that out. And I think that's kind of the Google is they've decided search is the vector that makes information important, not necessarily the information itself. And I think with books, it's, I mean, do you move that to the state? Do you say, well, orphan works? We'll just give it to the Library of Congress. We'll let Google index it because they're really good at indexing, and we'll we'll let the government figure out what to do with Orphan Works. I mean, is that the sort of legislation that we don't want? We don't want a monopoly. I want to let everyone use it. And, and you right? may want to let everybody use it. But here, here look, the problem I mean, could, the problem saying, with could, the problem with Google is, I mean, you know, ultimately a decision like that. Do you really want it to be decided in the context of litigation? And one company come out and become but, the arbiter, but, which but is to some lawyer, extent. But as a lawyer, you have to admire what they did there. Oh, right? I, I mean, well, but, yeah. but what, you, what you have <laughs> to admire. Like, no, what was very clever was okay. the way they used the class action yeah. process. I, right. I, look, I, so I the copyright don't, system, but they lost on it. Consent, they did lose on and that. they tried to use the class action right. system to flip that. Right. No, no, that was clever. That was clever. Right. right. I mean, but Google's okay. entire strategy when it comes to IP is almost built on we'll just do it, and then we'll go to court and say, these are all the arguments for why we should have done it. I mean, it's almost mp3.com kind of writ large with you know, $30 billion you know. of revenue every quarter. Wow. Well, I mean, they, their, their whole model is built on getting access to the data. You're right. right. It's generally not the data that they've created, which is why people who create you know, things like news and everything else get very upset and nervous mm -hmm. about Google, um, about getting it and getting it at, at as low cost as they can and then to some extent maintaining control over it because you can look at different areas where they, once they get access to the information, they tend to be far less open in giving other people access to it. Well, I mean, YouTube the, the, being is a that perfect was it. example. That's exactly where I was going. Because I mean, uh, YouTube is, yeah. I think Viacom can throw darts at YouTube all day and night and that, that engine is gonna keep turning and you know, they're never gonna be able to pull every song off of YouTube that infringes. You know, Google can build whatever algorithm they want. But the interesting thing is that, I mean, like with YouTube and with other things, I mean, they, they, once they have control of it, notwithstanding before they own it, their general mantra is it should be open to everybody to crawl and index. Once they own it, it's pretty much closed to everybody but them to crawl and index. So they, you know, again, it's kind of like a black hole. Things but so, but so, so Rick talked about the, the 96 Telecommunications Act. So w one of the key features there, and, and the one that eventually goes to the Supreme Court, you know, and, and the FCC figures out the rules, is about the degree of sharing and interconnection. Mm -hmm. would, you, would, you, would you like that kind of regime vis-a-vis -vis YouTube? Uh, I mean, I'm not a big, uh, I'm not a big uh, fan, of a fan of regulation. Huh. Right. Um, well, and, you're a Chicago guy. How could right. you? Right. I, I couldn't. I, <laughs> guys from the college, I'm less sure. Guys from the law school, I know where we are. Right. right? But, are. but 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 I will say, I, I am a big believer in litigation. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Most lawyers are. Okay. Yeah. So you know, I think we can deal with the problem. Now. Um, I, I want to turn completely at this point. So we've, I don't think we've exhausted copyright, but I think that uh, a lot of the interest in this uh, panel may have been more about sort of the mobile device market and stuff like that. Well, there's, there's, a, there's a way I want to get to it, which is, plays right off of what you guys just said. It's, it's the Telecom Act. You just made 
a direct sort of connection between how we regulate telecommunications and how we regulate search, right? Well, I and teach I, I teach a whole course, the, my network industries course, where right. the heart of that course is for as we and we start with the telegraph and move forward is about basically interconnection rules. Okay. Right. So that's great, but I mean, from my perspective now, and I think from a lot of my readers' perspectives, there is the access layer which stops, and then there is the service and content layer, which is a thriving industry, right? And I, I would think they would see YouTube and Google and whoever else is living in that content layer divorced from the access layer. So I don't know why it would be appropriate to regulate API access to search in the Telecom Act. Well, I, when you say in the Telecom Act, I, I, I okay. just use, I use that as an example of the kind of interconnection regulations that we have been willing to implement in some circumstances. So where, where, I, where, where did I, you put that? I, I guess it, in what well, God, framework? I mean, I can, I can make up as many new statutes as I need to, <laughs> right? I mean, that's not the issue, Well, but you, right? need, you need, I mean, I'm just saying, what, what title would you throw that under? You could throw it under Title 15, you Section think? 1. But, um, 62, <laughs> or, right? or Section 2. This is what I, I was like, the, most terrified uh, of. <laughs> No, but I, I think, I mean, I, th there's an interesting, in, when I saw that this was an issue we were going to talk about, I don't know if you've seen uh, Howard Chelansky's, yeah, Howard Chelansky. Uh, is, yeah, I, don't, Howard I, don't, I know Howard, obviously, yeah, and, yeah sure. And, but he's the, uh, he's the deputy director of the Bureau of Economics at the FTC and in charge of their Bureau of Competition. But he basically gave a talk, and it was really on network neutrality, but his point was, Look, where you have to be concerned is where the bottleneck is. And conceptually, it doesn't have to be down in the guts, Absolutely you know, whether not. it's spectrum or wires. It can be at somewhere at an application layer. And you know, from right. my perspective, it could be at Google. The, the, it could be a lot of different. The straightforward could be, story on Google you tell mm -hmm. is is that basically as you watch people click the links. Right. Right, you learn things, and that learning engine effectively gives rise to a natural monopoly. That would be the contention, right? right? Mm -hmm. And the network industries right. class I teach is about the regulation of natural monopoly. Right. There's nothing layer specific right. about right. And, that. But, that's but, your that point. but yeah, that's and the I point. And, and, the, the, and I will say the 96 Act, to some extent, although, uh, you know, I would, uh, I think you could look back and say that what happened between 34 and 96, and what finally. Uh, brought about the 96 Act was the, uh, the breakup of, uh, you know, Ma Bell yeah. and the, the antitrust regulation right. and, and Congress decided that you needed a way to kind of segue through that. But there was this conception really in the, in the 96 Act, um, a little bit of a vision beyond it, but that, that the bottleneck was always going to be at the guts, the kind of wire and the, and the you know, uh, the infrastructure level, which I don't, I'm not sure that it's entirely true today. I mean, there was kind of a vision forward that that wouldn't be the, the situation forever, and to some extent, it's not. Because there, if I look back in, in the 80s when we broke up AT&T, and I had, we were, I was there at the time, um, and today, I mean, it's, it's very different, uh, um, and to the extent you want to talk about AT&T and T-Mobile, it's, 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 it's a very <laughs> different <laughs> industry today in terms of what happens down there at the infrastructure level. Well, the 96 Act 96. is about trying to create local competition in the landline right. market. Right. That's a dying market. That's right. <laughs> I mean, so, so, so the, right, the premise, is it, is it really a dying market? Well, the though? numbers are, are yeah, I but mean, the, run I, the I, numbers. I just, I just I'm not got, saying people aren't talking on the phones, landlines. <laughs> no, landlines, right. but I mean, that's, <laughs> right. you know, that, same, that same piece of copper is most people's now access to the internet in a real and robust way. There aren't that many people out there with LTE phones who are actually getting what would qualify in any country other than the U.S. as broadband. <laughs> right. and Given that our definition have, of broadband is still, what's it gone up to, 2 MBP? Yes, now. Yeah, right, right. I and don't know. There, there are a lot of there are a lot of people there. I, 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 I mean, I, I would I would disagree. I think you're going to see. And it, wasn't it the case that last year, for the first time, there were fewer subscribers, landline subscribers? I mean, they're actually the numbers are actually going down. People are sort of disconnecting. I know where I live. There are. I've got the copper wire. I've got in theory a cable that I've also got fiber. But to wait, the wait, I, now. let me let me okay. just say I, I just got back the num if you look at the UK where they've unbundled the local loops, mm -hmm. that dynamic is not playing out because they have robust competition over those local loops now. Speeds over the past ten years, services has improved by an order of magnitude, prices have come down by an order of magnitude. 
there's still a very robust market on that copper. Right. I took your point to be that even if we th what we think of as a local telecommunications market for mm -hmm. voice calls is dying, right. your right. point was we still maybe only have three wires in the ground, and that's Correct. the issue we need yes. to talk to. Uh, yes. Understood. Right. right. And I understood. You know, when you have right now, you know, the biggest landline providers are AT&T and Verizon, who also happen to be the biggest wireless providers. And you could say, well, LTE should be the competition for your local service. You know, Verizon and the FCC does say that. It should be, but Verizon and AT&T, they cap your LTE service. So uh, I have friends in New York who have terrible Time Warner connections, right? They're really slow. <laughs> I have a friend in New York. Yeah, right. exactly. Um, and I would, you know, my instinct here would be like, well, just buy an LTE Wi-Fi device, put it in your house, you'll get 20 megs down or whatever. But you can't because it's capped at, at five gigabytes of, store, of bandwidth per month, right? right. And that's ridiculous. That means it functionally is no longer competition for your wireline service. And that's you know that's Verizon, I think, saying, well, we want you to get FiOS. Mm -hmm. You know, we AT and T saying we want you to get UVerse instead of buy this one piece of access that can deliver every type of content that you probably want. And I think that's really that when I make the distinction between layers, it's the service layer has almost become a utility, and it's the content layer that is the market. And I think there is not robust competition at the service layer. I don't think AT&T and Verizon, their plans are within $5 of each other. And the pricing pressure from T-Mobile, which is much cheaper, has not moved those plans significantly in forever. And, and but the solution to this is to roll out that 500 megahertz of spectrum that the FCC keeps telling us they're going to get for us, right? And why aren't we well, getting that? <laughs> why isn't it happening? Well, because we know that there's, a, I mean, the, the heart of that's going to come from the TV broadcasters, and there's obviously well, that's a, a, 700 megahertz a, a big fight about that. I'm sorry? That, isn't that, that's the seven, I mean, they sold it to Verizon. Well, but, they sold but, the, other they, but the national broadband plan, make of it what you will, obviously contemplates rolling out an enormous chunk of spectrum for these broadband services. But a lot of that's going to have to come from TV broadcasters who think they're entitled to it. Well, right. so there, I mean, that's the spectrum crunch argument. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah. The big, you know, at and But we don't want more wires in the ground, really. We no, want we just spectrum. want more radiation through our bodies. <laughs> yes, exactly, um, as much as possible. Uh, <laughs> I'm glowing on the inside, <laughs> glowing with data. Um, uh, well, let me, you know, the flip side, and this is the argument I've heard You're against. You're against more spectrum? No, I'm not against yeah, more okay. spectrum. But the argument, and I, I feel compelled to present it, is that you look at AT&T, they want to buy T-Mobile and t take their spectrum and do whatever they want to do with it. And they have millions upon millions of customers who are still on 2G devices, these old edge devices. And I think what well, probably costs them less than $39 billion on what they're going to spend on T-Mobile to say everybody gets a new phone and it's now 3G compatible and we can repurpose this old spectrum. But that argument seems to have been tossed away in the wash. I mean, there is a certain amount of spectrum inefficiency that we have. So what did you get out of a 361-page filing we made last week? <laughs> 381. 81 uh, pages. I have not read it yet. So it, I, is, uh, it is a delight, which I encourage none of you to read. They filed this a week ago today. A week ago today. Um, so, you know, it's, it's an antitrust argument, right? I mean, we're basically saying we'll buy T-Mobile and the market will still be competitive. It's the FCC version of an antitrust Yeah, market. exactly. <laughs> which is not exactly an antitrust. Well, I mean, there's, the FCC is very <laughs> concerned about competition in wireless, right? And so if you look at the numbers, and this is the only chart I ever wanted to Sadly, you won't see it. Um, you know, there's Verizon has 90 some million subscribers. AT&T is around there, and then Sprint, T-Mobile are the other ones. They, they're going to buy T-Mobile, and they're going to be way bigger than Verizon, 120, and then Sprint will be at 30 million. So now we have a duopoly. And AT&T's argument is, well, T-Mobile sucks, and they're not competitive with us now. So it doesn't matter if we buy them because Cincinnati Bell is more competitive in southwestern Ohio than T-Mobile, and it is 381 pages. Of I'm not even kidding. It is like put down after put down of T-Mobile. It is like, I was reading, I was like, we have to write about this because it's hilarious. This, this, com this, this company is so terrible that we have to spend billions of yeah, dollars. 30, this, this, is, this is $39 billion. Well, that's, you know, it, that could be right, just so we're clear, right? And, and it's true. T-Mobile is a you know, they're failing company. And, right. and this comes back to devices. I think one of the reasons T-Mobile is failing, and Deutsche Telekom, which is their owner, says pretty much directly they don't have the iPhone. If they had the iPhone, then their price, their plans would be competitive because people would say, well, it's cheaper and I still get an iPhone. But that's because we have device exclusives. So tell us about the iPhone. Well, it's this thing. It's about this big. Okay. <laughs> Meaning, so do you, would now. you, would you, <laughs> would you <laughs> apply? You know, there white, are lines. Exactly. What <laughs> an innovation There are, there are that lines. Is. This thing is 10 months old. There are lines today for the white iPhone. I mean, you, you cannot underestimate the demand for services that this thing 
causes. So would you have barred the exclusive, original exclusive deal between this is Apple, the five year. between Apple and AT and T? That's the, that's got to be the starting point for that conversation. Well, so I'm I don't. It's very strange this five year exclusive. The only outlet that ever reported on it was USA Today. That was it. One mentioned USA there Today. There are leading technolo technology. That's when I okay. look for tech news. Yeah, I go to USA I do not, Today. I do not look at myself. <laughs> right. I stare in the mirror every day. Why aren't I as good as USA Today? <laughs> uh, uh, no. So the US one mention of this exclusive when the first iPhone came out in 2007, uh, and it was re-reported as fact, which is insane. Nobody ever confirmed it. And then there's the antitrust in California over the iPhone right now, saying this exclusive arms consumers. And Apple's lawyers point to the USA Today article saying it was disclosed. They don't confirm that there is an exclusive. They say if there was one, let's it was disclosed. Let's, let's assume there was. Well, so that's it's weird to me because the, at the end of the, your two-year contract, you still have an iPhone. Right? The, the five-year exclusive is I hate AT&T after two years. I want to buy a new iPhone and go to another carrier? This, this guy who's never built a telephone comes to this company and says, I, I, I've got an idea. Oh, it's going to involve lots of joint investments. Do you know, so here's right? an Apple meeting. No, so yes. Like, every Apple meeting I've ever heard of has gone like this. They walk into the room, they sit down and say, we might do X. Would you be interested? And they, they're like, yeah, you're Apple. And they're like, all right, we'll send you a contract when we announce it after we're done. And that's like pretty much it. They don't tell you what they're going to do. They don't tell you. I mean, this is Apple. They're the most secretive company in the industry. Whereas Microsoft, is like, everybody, check out what we're going to do. <laughs> Please be interested in this. You know, um, well, that's because, you know, the relative fortunes have tilted a little bit. Please, and... we'll send you five, I, right? I want to I follow up for a second. R Rick, you made the, sort of a, a comment in passing. It's the FCC version of the antitrust argument with a little the, the hint of disdain. In that's because I'm an antitrust lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> where, do, where do you think this is going? Well, I mean, I... There's kind of an interesting political dynamic to the way the uh, uh, the antitrust division, the FCC, operates. And basically, uh, and I'm sure this will be the same way, the FCC will largely look at the antitrust division to make the decision on, on the competition issues. And at least, I haven't read the filing, but uh, typically if you look at what people put in FCC filings, they're not as uh, sophisticated, I'll put it that way. Well, they've, they've got a lot from Dennis Carlton here. Well, and Dennis is, is, a, is outstanding. Across uh, the Midway at Booth, yes. co-author of mine, I very, say, very, so. very uh, uh, frequently used expert I'm sure. by me. Yep, exactly. Um, so, uh, you know, so they've got, they've got good people. But again, if you just look at, at uh, typically the kind of arguments that are made to the FCC, they tend to be a little more superficial. They tend to be a little more directed to, you know, the PR front. Uh, I mean, it was sent to me directly. I mean, it okay, was, well, there you this go. is like a so, media argument. They, they <laughs> yeah, were right, like, right. look at this. We want your readers to understand. And, and, they, and, and to Congress. And, you know, and, and if you look at the FCC's mandate, it's really to promote and protect the public interest, yep. which is a more general standard Absolutely. than what the antitrust agencies look at. The antitrust agencies, on the other hand, will look at, and, you know, and people like Dennis will be very... Uh, persuasive to them, um, and they'll make very sophisticated arguments, and they'll look at, I think, the contrast between, you know, is it really true that the benefits from adding the spectrum to, that AT&T has, adding the spectrum, can they really generate all these benefits? Is it really going to, you know, promote the rollout of 4G or LTE, you know, more quickly than would otherwise be the case, which are basically their arguments? Um, as against it's basically creating a duopoly. Now, the one thing I will say is the, um, and it's kind of an interesting phenomenon, which I'm not sure people really pick up on, but there is kind of a sense at the agencies these days that duopolies aren't all that bad. I mean, if you take a look at, for example, it, well, it, I mean, and, and you know, and you, you, I know, you can make the argument, and some people, I've heard some commissioners at the FTC, uh, take that away from the um, Oracle PeopleSoft That's argument. That's interesting. Uh, and, um, and you can look at the, uh, speaking of, of Google and Apple, uh, if you look at the uh, Google ITA, not, yeah, not the Google ITA, but the Google AdMob case, ultimately the reason the FTC didn't do anything in that case was because they thought that Apple was doing certain things to create 
another capability. I mean, that's what they said. No, no, no. I, and, I, I and, consulted and, on the opposition yeah. on that deal. When we were making, I thought, huge progress. No, I mean, I And then Apple went out I, and I, I bought one of these right. companies. I, I, I will, I will, I will, I will say that. <laughs> I will say we, we, we were on the same side of that issue. But, but I will just say that, that I think, you know, there was, there was a lot of support at the staff level. But the problem with the position was that, you know, it doesn't have to be a world between Google and uh, Apple. Uh, there are other people who have mobile platforms. But part of the issue of Google having AdMob was that um, it took that away, which was kind of important for monetizing apps, from every other platform right. that would be out there. And, right. and that was something that the, uh, that the FTC lost sight of. But if you look at it, I mean, there is kind of a view today that, that maybe duopolies aren't that bad, and maybe uh, two is enough. So it'll be interesting to see in the, in, you know, the AT&T, T-Mobile deal that, you know, they, they might come away with the argument that, gee, it's better to have a stronger, you know, uh, uh, better perceived by consumers network on AT&T's part fighting with Verizon than right. having T-Mobile. I, I think there. that's, from my perspective, that is the entire argument, that access has become this utility. And, you know, the carriers will constantly point to that explosion in devices is evidence of competition. I think that's completely misguided, right? Having a million Android devices that are kind of the same in the iPhone, that's, I mean, that's great. And then that's the manufacturers doing it. But the only manufacturer that really thinks about the consumer and builds a consumer relationship is Apple. And if you go and talk to Samsung or whoever, they say our customer is the carrier. So now they only have two major customers, right? And they're not competing as, I think, as ferociously as you'd like to see. And I'd like to see all of those manufacturers and all those platforms begin to, to interact directly with the consumer and have the consumer say, well, I hate AT&T. My AT&T service is bad. I want to go take my phone, my device that I bought from a manufacturer, and plug it into a different service. And you cannot do that right now. You cannot. But there's how no. Does, how does allowing this merger to go forward allow you to do that? Well, so I mean, my very, and I will openly say this is a naive and idealistic argument, is that this is a window for regulatory reform. And maybe that's wrong. You and really I think the FCC is going to do something? So you just mean that opportunistically, right? Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. Well, I'll I, mean, talk I, I don't mean it. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah, yeah, you yeah. actually have, a, right. and, I mean, again, it's, a, it's an interesting sort of study more in politics than economics. But this deal is arising at a time at the agencies where they're much more willing to look <laughs> at what you'd call behavioral remedies, which is another word for regulation. As opposed to you just don't want to say it. <laughs> as opposed, well, the, no, the, the antitrust lawyers would never say they regulate. Um, <laughs> as opposed to structural remedies, because you know, for years, in fact, the old AT and T decree was all premised on the fact that you have to have structural remedies right. to deal with problems. And historically, until very recently, the only way to deal with problems in transactions was through some sort of structural relief, mm -hmm. you know, divesting some of the spectrum, perhaps, that, that they right, bought. Right. But if you look at things like the Live Nation case, if you look at the mm -hmm. Google ITA case, if you look at a, at a number of cases, increasingly the agencies, Comcast, uh, uh, NBC is another one, the agencies are moving more towards accepting behavioral decrees as opposed to structural relief. So it's not unreasonable, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but it's not unreasonable to expect that what would come out of the uh, AT&T T-Mobile thing is some kind of behavioral decree. Well, see, what I, so what I would ask for is, you know, when Verizon bought the 700 megahertz spectrum, they did it conditionally. You have to put open access on your, on your market. You have to be able to connect any compatible device. You have to run the app. I would say you could approve this merger and say, well, you're, now you're under the same rules. And on top of that, you have to build devices that are interoperable with Verizon's network. The same chunk of spectrum for the most part, 700 megahertz. And I think that would reduce consumer friction. I mean, how many people in here have an iPhone at and That's probably most of you. <laughs> how many of you think at and sucks? <laughs> right? Does anybody in here have a Verizon iPhone? Right. Are you happy with it? Look at how smug yes. he looks. <laughs> <laughs> right? yeah, cool. Now, let me ask you this. If you could That's switch, great. the people at a who don't like at and if you could just push a button on your phone and switch, you would to do it. T-Mobile, say. No, wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, T-Mobile's cheaper. If you could do that, that'd be even better. But if you could switch, pay the same rate, and get better service, you would probably do it. I mean, unless you have some blind affinity for AT&T. There's but, a technology difference. Well, yeah, right. I, I understand the technology difference. But, but if you could, you, would you, right? No, you love AT&T is what's happening. No, I, I don't. But 
the fact is I can't travel I know you're, the Verizon uh, iPhone can. to Europe. Okay, right, so that's... Yeah, well, you may not be able to with the iPhone 5 either, so... Right. <laughs> Do you want me to talk about iPhone 5? Well, I actually, all actually we, only, we only have a few minutes left, so I want to see if we have any a yes, couple good. of questions yeah. that we can do out here. Yeah, back then. Can you talk a little bit specifically about the ITA deal? I mean, I've heard that that may be the first shot really across Google's bow to push back on some of these antitrust issues. Two shots, I think. I mean, in, yeah. the, sen no, in the sense of, I think the Google Buzz thing's huge. So I, but talk about Google ITA. Now, I think, I think that uh, there is a view that that was what uh, the government was doing. Uh, you know, if you look at the decree, there's a provision. It's kind of an interesting uh, provision because I don't think I've ever seen it in another decree that essentially says, if you think Google is doing anything bad, please report it to us. <laughs> now, it doesn't, it doesn't really say what bad is. It just says that if it's unfair, and, um, and it's kind of an open invitation for people to raise issues about Google to the Department of Justice uh, so that they can look at it. Now, technically, it's supposed to be related to travel because ITA was, uh, uh, you know, dealt with travel. Um, but I think it is uh, a little broader. Um, you know, I mean, uh, some people thought that maybe they shouldn't be allowed to make that acquisition, that there were certain uh, negative aspects of it that were pretty hard to deal with in a decree. Uh, but obviously, you know, that's not how the government saw it. But there is that provision. I think the other thing that, you know, you can look at the press and see, um, the Europeans are more broadly investigating Google. Uh, it started out with some um, uh, specific complaints, but I think that's a, a broader investigation. And there's a lot you see in the press that the FTC and DOJ are trying to decide which one of them um, looks at Google more broadly in terms of what it's doing. And I think it's, it's you know, frankly, it's not um, unreasonable to expect that the people who, uh, you know, are largely responsible for the state of the law as it is today. I mean, Eric Schmidt was a big leader of the, um, uh, of the fight against Microsoft, which established a lot of the rules that are applicable uh, to Google. Uh, a lot of their lawyers sort of were making those same arguments. Um, and it's not unreasonable to say, well, you know, let's kind of look at and see whether or not uh, uh, that shoe fits Google. And uh, I think that's probably going to happen sooner rather than later. I mean, the Google Buzz settlement puts in place a 20-year investigatory structure over privacy with the FTC. That's remarkable, right? So, so uh, the way in which those together, you know, I think change the legal landscape for Google is pretty substantial. Now, I think Google, I mean, Google is definitely, uh, there's a lot of focus on them in Congress. There's a lot of focus elsewhere, and there are issues. There are people like some of my clients, uh, other than Microsoft, they're suing them. Um, and, um, and it's, you know, it's, uh, it's an interesting company. And I think that, you know, th they're very sophisticated. They're very good. They're, you know, they are very interesting. Um, and I think what they did in the Google Book settlement in terms of being clever is pretty much indicative of, I mean, they're, they're right. well represented. Exactly. They, you know, you, and, yep. and I think that's pretty much across the board. But, um, it's just at some point you can't get away with saying, look, look at our motto. It says we do no evil. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that should be the end of it. And it's funny. I, I'll tell one other little anecdote. I talked to the uh, Wall Street Journal, and uh, they had me, I wrote an op-ed about, uh, I don't know, six months ago. And I was talking to the editors, writing it completely in a vacuum, uh, you know, not realizing that, they were also talking at the same time to Google. And the premise of, my, of what I said was, look, you know, just saying trust us is not good enough. You have to actually, you know, there are things that are out there that suggest that maybe they are violating the law. And, you know, there are plenty of examples that say that you can actually look at it just because it's complex technology doesn't mean you have to no. give a pass on it. Um, so mine uh, ran, and they ran one from a guy, I've forgotten who, what his name is, at Google, the same way. And, his, and it, was, it was amazing, because I didn't know he was going to write it, and his whole thing was, this is way too you know, complex techno technologically, people can't really understand it, it's really sort of beyond the capability of antitrust to deal with it. Um, and I'm, you know, I don't think he knew I was writing what I was writing, but it's just amazing, I mean, that's kind of their... 
But we go through stages on that, right? So I think of the Microsoft 2 case, which sort of gets lost in the sands of time, right? The 2-1 decision about whether or not there was a contempt violation of the consent decree right. as being very much a decision what about you, saying... You, you, Mike, you view the original consent decree as... as Microsoft 1, 1 oh, the Tunniak okay, right, case, right, exactly. Right, okay, all right, yeah, right, the right, Tunniak right, case. Right, 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 okay. So the Microsoft 2 case is very much a case which says, gosh, this is complex and hard, we should stay away from it. That's not how Microsoft 3 came out. That's so, not, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. So I, you know, they'll get there. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think this goes back to sort of this culture that we don't regulate the internet. And I think Google is, they've become synonymous with internet culture. We're the smartest guys here. We'll do it. Just come, Google is in charge, right? And that is the mass perception of Google, that they are the smartest ones, right? Mm -hmm. And this idea that we I don't, don't know like, Facebook. Is yeah, I was going to uh, say, yeah. Facebook's going to eat their lunch. Yeah, and then they're going to eat everybody else's well, lunch and take know. a picture of it. I don't know who the next lunchy yeah. is. But, you know, Google but, and Facebook but, actually have the same kind of internal conflict, right, which is they make their money by selling your data, right? Oh, I, but I don't think that's a problem. But I'm saying Facebook, I think it's easier for Facebook to go into search than for Google to go into social. They're, they're And that's why, that's why Buzz it. is such a fiasco. And well, Buzz, there, is a, Buzz is a structural fiasco. If they had done Buzz correctly, I think they would have... They would have but a legal different. fiasco too. Right, but it's yeah. a legal fiasco because, I mean, literally the problem with Buzz. Yeah, you guys know about Google Buzz. They tried to make it basically a Twitter competitor, and everybody at Google only has Google contacts they talk to. So they said, screw it. We'll just make everybody at your Gmail will public following list all of your contacts in Gmail, and then normal humans got access to Buzz, <laughs> and it was like. My mistress is on here. Like, <laughs> the, you know, my abusive ex-husband is on here. Now he knows where I live and what I'm doing. And that's like, I mean, that is literally like just a Google founder mentality. It's like ev everybody should live their Transparency lives. Transparency is always right, good. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. But I mean, that's like, if they'd done that correctly, you know, Buzz would have actually been a competitor. And they wouldn't. I mean, that's like a mistake, like a really dumb mistake that led to this regime. I think my question for you is, is that the right remedy to have this 20-year investigatory policy or should we actually move I mean, there's the FCC white paper in December. Well, you're, it's interesting because I'm like the statist well, here. I don't know but, when but, I became this person. But I mean, but you, you're like, but in a T-Mobile <laughs> situation, you're in favor of this opportunistic regulation. And that's what I see the FTC is ha effectively having done in the Google Buzz situation. Right. No, it's clearly, and you're right, the white paper, we, we did that in my tech policy seminar. It's a much broader inquiry and that seems like the better framework, but it's so much easier to do these things opportunistically. Well, well, well when do you say, I mean, I think I, my question that I keep asking is, when do you say, well, okay, there isn't the internet economy, and we're going to see how it develops. When do you say, the internet is the economy. We know what the shady aspects of the economy are. We know what confidence schemes and pyramid schemes in the economy look like. We know, and we think we have an idea of what consumers' reasonable expectation of privacy are in this market, and we can just legislate them. Well, let me just say this. I mean, that, that's one of the benefits of, of uh, litigation. <laughs> if you, if you, now I mean seriously, in, in this sense that if I go back to the late 80s and the early 90s, you could make exactly the same argument about PCs and operating systems and everything else. There was a lot of, there was a lot of competition. One of the things that surprised some people when folks started focusing on Microsoft is, um, I will tell you, it's hard to understand maybe today, but the notion of using antitrust against software companies just generally was kind of a, a shocking notion because you, for years everybody had thought about brick and mortar, you know, buildings in the ground, things that I could touch and feel. Um, and so software was the first place that you went to it. Well, what, what you can look at in retrospect is there was litigation, it was around Microsoft because there was this perception that this company out of that chaos, if you will, had sort of emerged as the organizing principle. Mm -hmm. And you applied the, uh, the law to it, and certain rules came out. I think the same thing is true, I mean it's not, it's not all of the internet, but there is a part of the internet and that is search and the importance of it, okay, where, where Google is sort of emerging at some point. Um, Facebook may emerge as part of the internet, and it's and it's at, sort of at that point when they begin to engage in practices that are harmful to others, trying to compete or challenge them. When you probably ought to be looking at it and applying the law and seeing whether or not they're conducting themselves appropriately, and it just so happens that 
they're better than everybody else, and that's how they get to that position. So this is like a platform not. argument, right? I mean, it's right. But that, and that's pretty much so what's big. been happening. Yeah, and that's pretty much what you know. All of these things are kind of platforms, and they're just platforms that have developed in different areas as technology has changed, as mores have changed. And essentially, it's when you get to that stage, the law imposes certain obligations on you that you have to take seriously. And, and if you don't, and if, you know, if there are problems, then... But should there be a baseline for all these platforms? Yeah, we got to stop. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, some Something. people have class at uh, 1.30, so oh, anyone who yeah. does, feel free right. to no, leave no. now and go gracefully. And then uh, <laughs> people can stay. Maybe we can take another question or two sure. for the panel. Yeah. But yeah, feel free to go if you have class. And, and thanks for coming. Or and if you've we'll, had we'll have a little bit more time. <laughs> <laughs> We're extremely boring. Actually, yes, yeah, so, so many people are going. Well, I want to thank uh, Seth, yeah, actually. Yeah. Yeah. What a great panel. Thank you for coming, and, and thank you to all our speakers. And also, special thanks to Chris Cooley, big help setting this up, and to SGFC for helping fund it, and to the rest of Link and everyone who helped uh, make this event a reality. And yeah, if you guys have the time, just hang out. And if the panelists are willing, we can take a, another question or two. Yeah, or? I mean, if, if anybody's left that wants yeah. to ask <laughs> Yeah, we'll see how it goes. Great, thanks. Yeah. Um, you talked earlier about uh, Sony hacking thing suing George Haas. And I was thinking, it, it's kind of a law and business question because Microsoft, the Kinect was hacked almost immediately after it was released. And the way Microsoft dealt with it was they're like, okay, here's a dev kit for everybody to hack the, well, they the Kinect out, course, right? They started out much more poorly, right? Right, and right. Their initial reaction was, don't do this, right. you'll wreck the user experience. And nobody paid attention to them. And then they turned around, and yeah. now Microsoft is like, everybody sees Microsoft as like, these guys are so friendly, and we, we love Microsoft for letting us Right, you know, and I think one of the reasons for that is that the most interesting thing about the Kinect is these hacks. Because you, yeah. the games are like, people bought them, and now it's like the Wii, they're just sitting around. And I think they see the hacks from a media perspective as a way to keep the story alive. Like, look at all these interesting things people are doing with the Kinect. And you'll notice the story is never, look at all these Kinect games people are buying, or look at how awesome these new Kinect games are. I'll change, I think, in a few months. There's going to be another wave of games for the, the product. But, but from their perspective, Microsoft hadn't been cool in a century, basically, right? Yeah. And, so, and so the chance to look cool for just... This is the coolest quite thing they've done. Right? Yeah, this is the coolest that thing they've done affects who's going to come work there and the like. And so that's, that's clearly yeah, the it's biggest big value. For and, you know, actually, there's an editorial on our site today. It's titled, Sony, Please Be Sony Again. It's all about they how were Sony great has company. mismanaged their, their image and their products. That's been a century. I'm let you oh, that, <laughs> well, Microsoft, they made the century up. The Sony does go back, right? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah, exactly. What kind of recourse do the users have? Uh, is it against, can they, can they have a suit against Sony for having that kind of breach? Um, oh, yeah, no, this, I mean, this is a class action process. I mean, every time, and this is, I call them taco suits. It's like a terrible joke I've made up. So uh, every time anything happens, I get, 50 class action suits sent to me from all these opportunistic attorneys. And the funniest one I ever got was about Taco Bell. And they sued them because Taco Bell beef is not 100% beef. It's like 90% beef because there's 10% flavoring in there. It's like a ridiculous lawsuit. <laughs> so I've been calling them all taco suits. I mean, I think the Sony one is, um, I think that's a little bit more, I mean, you have all these users who sign the same contract and you know, the same user agreement. They've all suffered a really similar harm, which is tangible. Credit card numbers were taken. There's something in there. Um, there's already been a case filed, I think, today. I imagine we'll see three or more state court cases. But I mean, it's all class action. The taco suit has gone away, just in case. The you taco know, suit has saw the full page ads yeah. they've been running, well, saying, "Give us an apology." Now suing the law firm exact yeah. case. Yeah, it's reverse taco suit. It's a double decker taco suit. Yeah. You got a follow up on that? Yeah, and also. Recently, like for the new Mortal Kombat game, um, they've separated the online content from the time time like um, if they try to resell it through like GameStop or second user. Right, and you need the code if you rebuy it. Yeah, so um, do you see any kind of litigation on that of separating between like a first purchaser? I mean, this is a this is a first sale question, right? I mean, and they're they're telling you that your first sale right is only the physical thing and not this licensed content. That's separate. And it's that's quite plausible. <laughs> right. And I, yeah. You should read the Blizzard World of Warcraft cases. Right. Yeah. So. I mean, I, I mean, this is like the, the whole you can't compete with reckless records argument, right? There's the way I would start to compete with reckless records is you would buy an inventory of content and set up a store and sell it, right? And you 
can't do that online, right? You, getting that inventory is really hard. Well, now we're really going to have to wrap up because actually a class wants to come in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all. So How dare they? Thank you.